Uh, I'd like to introduce our next presenter, and that is Philip Hooker, uh, VP of Strategic Programs and Cloud Innovation at Software AG. Uh, Phil's got 25 years of experience working with companies like Orange, Nokia, Barclays, and Wipro on strategic business development and transfer transformation initiatives. Today, he leads uh, programs to accelerate the exploitation of cloud, and Phil is an original with uh, Cumulosity. Philip, uh, welcome. Excellent, thanks, Keith. Um, so industrial equipment manufacturers are facing the same challenges when creating connected products. How do you create a secure product that is still easy to manage? How do you create and operate a product that remains reliable and robust 10 years into the future? And how do you do all this whilst manage, managing, um, balancing the features versus cost? These product manufacturers need three simple things, secure cloud and hardware agnostic connectivity, robust device management and monitoring, and this software to be efficient on resource constrained devices. My name is Philip Hooker, VP of Strategic Programs at Software AG. And I'd like to show you how the open source Thinedge.io initiative can change your connected product strategy. As mentioned before, IoT connectivity is transforming the industrial equipment market. The requirement to have increasingly sophisticated analytics close to the data source is driving pioneering PLC manufacturers like Brainboxes and Kunbus to embed standardized compute modules into their devices. This allows industrial automation service providers to rapidly prototype solutions and deploy them straight into industrialized devices, minimizing downtime, speed and response time, and maximizing profits. IFM's IOKey provides a way to easily monitor, manage, and analyze data online. With IOKey, the readings from over 10,000 sensors from more than 200 manufacturers are visible in the cloud in less than one minute. The solution consists of an IOKey cellular gateway, cloud app, and a European-wide flat data rate. Another example is Gardner Denver's ICON solution, which provides air compressor customers with proactive real-time insight that ensures machine uptime and efficient performance. ICON is available as standard on all new machines and can be retrofitted to existing compression installations. It even supports auxiliary equipment and non-Gardner Denver-based products, providing customers with a unified digital experience to manage their entire compressed air system. Addressing the connectivity challenge is not made easier by the lack of standardization across the industry, forcing enterprises to make early decisions that have potentially irreversible consequences. Until recently, manufacturers had limited choices. Some enterprises chose to make sense of the jumbled technology landscape and develop the connectivity adapters for their solutions themselves. This is a considerable undertaking and shouldn't be underestimated especially as embedded IoT software engineers are a scarce and expensive resource. IoTerra estimates that the development of a single IoT connectivity adapter could take 13 to 16 weeks and cost $40,000. This obviously poses a significant hindrance to growth, especially as ongoing software maintenance costs are typically three times the initial development cost. Other enterprises have chosen to go all in with one of the big cloud vendors. Embedding their vendors device agent or SDKs into the core software of their connected product and permanently tethering their fielded devices to the capabilities of that vendor. Whilst this does initially reduce some complexity, it also significantly limits strategic multi-sourcing, complicates deployments across regions with different data regulations, and excludes sales in B2B2X opportunities where the end customer's choice of cloud platform is sacrosanct. Now, there is a third option with the open source Thinish.io initiative that provides robust, extensible cloud agnostic IoT connectivity. Through providing standardized cloud and inter-process connectivity, it simplifies software development and allows apps developed in different programming languages to be easily integrated within the same product. This reduces the number of code variants for hardware and IoT platform combinations and the associated software management overhead. Furthermore, with a growing ecosystem of community and commercial software being developed for the standard, enterprises can accelerate the time to market and efficiently increase the level of sophistication of their products. When considering connected products, it is beneficial to understand where they reside on the edge continuum of distributed compute resources, typically framed by near cloud fog compute at one end and microcontroller based micro edges at the other. 
Most IoT edge discussions today focus on the so-called thick edges deployed in, onto industrialized PCs with many gigabytes of RAM that allow it to support cloud-native technologies like virtualization and containers. The category used most in connected products, however, is thin edge with only megabytes of RAM and a lightweight OS. Thin edge dominates the embedded systems market with the Linux variants like Embedded Linux, Debian, and Angstrom being used in over 30% of all products. What is important to consider is that at this end of the continuum, the overall level of sophistication is low, but the volume of deployed edges is extremely high, which imposes a very stringent control of development and production to ensure conformance to the predetermined bill of materials. So, Last, last year saw IoT considered to be important to 50% of all embedded projects for the first time, which is a huge statement considering the heterogene heterogeneity of the projects. Of the IoT projects in progress, 55% of them <coughs> are creating edge devices or systems through enhancing the capabilities of previously unconnected products and creating new natively connected products. However, with 44% of all embedded projects being new to the world. Additional challenges are created in keeping costs down. The EE Times found that 58% of projects are completed after the scheduled completion date, regardless of the advance, advances in development tooling and methodology. One potential reason is for the uh, rising level of sophisticated demand in, <coughs> sorry, in products, evidenced by the 50% year-on-year increase in IoT to cloud projects being undertaken. <coughs> IoT connectivity and analytics expertise are essential to these projects and have caused the first significant change in the average embedded product team for the last five years. With the other engineer category of non-typical embedded resources growing by 200%, whilst virtually every other category remained the same. In developing connected products, a number of common challenges need to be overcome. Networks can be unreliable, unsecure, and in some cases, expensive to use. Unfortunately, connected product manufacturers need to ensure that their data is transferred reliably over these unreliable networks. We, re we recently worked with a company which has devices mounted on elevators. These elevators move up and down in the building. When they're at the top of the building, they have great cellular connection. And when they're on the basement, they have extremely poor connection. In this scenario, you can imagine how difficult it is to transfer all new software, a new software version to these devices. With the stellar networks, you can have additional challenges, like limited throughput in remote areas and the need to pay for every byte sent. Here, a lot of emphasis is put on reducing the messaging traffic, which can save a considerable amount of money when connecting hundreds of thousands of devices which run 24 seven. Once the device is connected, it can be managed remotely. With, uh, with over-the-air firmware, firmware and software updates, this allows manufacturers to ensure that fielded devices are running the optimum software and enables new functionality or configurations to be distributed. As already mentioned, these connected products are built to a tight bill of materials, which is optimized to be as price efficient as possible at production scale and often results in bespoke builds. Of course, there are already solutions out in the market that solve some of these problems, like the connectivity agents or SDKs from cloud or hardware vendors. However, these only support their specific platform, which imposes vendor lock-in that might be okay for some enterprises, but is not acceptable to most. It is for this purpose that we initiated the open source ThinEdge.io project with our lead contributors, IFM, Nexus, Adamus, Initum, and a number of others. The project draws from our combined experiences connecting millions of IoT devices to the cloud. Many of these projects didn't start from a green field. Instead, the devices were already developed and running software. For example, PLC manufacturers wanting to connect their devices to the cloud to transfer operational data like real-time analytics results. Gateway partners wanted to optimize the configuration of industrial fuel bus converters when connecting to SCADA historians and industrial machine manufacturers wanting to provide remote monitoring and management of their equipment to ensure optimum performance. In all of these cases, there is existing software, 
to which ThinEdge.io can be installed to provide out-of-the-box cloud agnostic connectivity and robust device management with a low compute footprint. This allows embedded device developers to separate the software development life cycles of their business logic from the connectivity logic and gain considerable efficiencies in the process. Let's have a look to see what's included in the ThinEdge.io project. Firstly, ThinEdge.io is available under the Apache 2.0 license, so you are free to make it part of your own connected product, deploy it on your own hardware, and run it to next your own software. It is designed to run on resource-constrained devices, which could be powered by ARM v6, v7, v8, or other processors, with only a small amount of memory available. As mentioned earlier, this is a complete contrast to the thick edge platforms, which typically run cloud-native technologies. To connect, to connect to the different cloud platforms, ThinEdge.io uses the MQTT bridge that provides an MQTT client to the, connect to the, all these platforms. MQTT is probably now the most widely used IoT protocol and supported by all the cloud platforms stated here and most others. But why is it called an MQTT bridge and not MQTT client? This is because ThinEdge.io includes an additional MQTT broker component. Traditionally, devices are connected to cloud platforms using device SDKs. And each vendor had SDKs for different programming languages. Cumulosity IoT, for example, has device SDKs for C, Python, Java, and so on. And the same is true for Azure, AWS, and other vendors. We found that this language-specific approach has a lot of flaws and restricted us in supporting even more languages. So instead of compounding the problem with more language-specific SDKs, we decided on an approach where code written in any programming language can connect via an inter-process communication protocol. It was then obvious not to invent a new protocol, but to reuse the common MQTT protocol again. The MQTT broker provides the communication protocol between the different software components resident on the device. So now we have the inter-process and cloud communication protocol established. The data integration needs to be considered. For this, there is a data mapper. The data mapper adds semantics and reformats the lightweight internal data format so that it can be correctly recognized by the destination cloud platform. Each cloud platform typically requires its own data format, meaning that the temperature measurement captured on the device, for example, needs to be in the correct format to be recognized as a temperature measurement in the destination cloud platform. Protocol interoperability is needed, but also data format interoperability. And this is provided by the data mapper. The last component that connects to the MQTT broker is a device management agent. The device management agent provides all device management features designed for remote and over the air updates of firmware, software, and configuration. It is built to be extensible with plugin support for Mender, Debian, Docker, and more. In addition, it also provides monitoring of the components of the IoT device. Lastly, there is a command line interface. This allows easy configuration and starting and stopping of the complete ThinEdge.io. In our experience, we have found that it is non-trivial to manage certificates in IoT devices, especially for newcomers. So we have put a lot of effort into providing certificate management that makes it easy for both developers and also operators in live deployments. With the foundation technologies provided by ThinEdge.io, we are working with the contributors to make a range of third-party modules available on both a community and commercial basis. This further simplifies the development in creating sophisticated connected products. And as this is an open source project, we are open about our technology choices. We have developed most of the key components in Rust, including the command line interface. But we want to emphasize that anyone can contribute components in any programming language using our plugin mechanisms and their interface. As mentioned, we created a simplified MQTT payload format for the internal MQTT broker and various payload mappers for the different cloud platforms and services. These are all extensible, and you can use your own payload standards in combination with the corresponding mappers. So to summarize the advantages of ThinEdge.io, we have put a lot of effort in providing more options for you. 
We didn't want to reduce the number of alternatives, but increase them to your advantage. So you can connect to many IoT platforms out of the box. You can use any programming language, C, C++, Rust, or whatever you like, and send data to the cloud using the internal MQTT bus. As mentioned, internally we used in Rust a lot because we found it to be a very secure language which is still very efficient. But you can use any language you're comfortable with. You can use any message payload, your own payload format, cloud-specific ones, industry-specific formats like Aqua and so on. You can use any hardware or Linux-based uh, operating system platform. Finnish.io comes with robust device management based on our combined experience of managing millions of globally deployed devices. It also includes an over-the-air software management agent that is extensible for different software artifacts beyond Debian and Docker. There's also firmware management, firmware management, configuration management and monitoring with more capabilities during the coming releases. As, as Thinedge.io has been created to run on devices with limited resources, we are targeting a resource usage less than 16 megabytes of RAM and put, have put a lot of effort into ensuring its reliability with bootstraps and other mechanisms. So I invite you to get involved and find out more at our website, thin-edge.io, or our GitHub project page, and follow us on Twitter. In addition, uh, I'd like to, inv uh, to invite you to the first thinedge.io community meetup on the 27th of October. We are keen to engage with the embedded software engineers and software developers interested in thinedge.io, and aim to cover an overview of thinedge.io, technical deep dives into cloud connections, software management, and extensions. Also, contribute to sessions on security, um, uh, industrial protocol adapters, stream analytics, and more. Don't miss it. So lastly, thanks for listening. I really hope you can now see the advantages of leveraging an open source software project for secure cloud agnostic IoT connectivity. Please don't hesitate to contact me directly or check out our uh, website, Finish.io, and also our GitHub page. Thank you, and stay safe. Terrific stuff, Philip. Uh, really, uh, really enjoyed that, and uh, uh, was was surprised to hear s so much about the advantages of open source. I mean, uh, obviously that that's a discussion that's been around for a long time, uh, and we've got incidentally plenty of time. So, I wanted to start with a couple sort of open-ended questions for you. Um, you know, the Apache Group has been around for more than a decade. Uh, uh, you know, there have been long discussions about. The, the value of open source and and how it works. Um, and you did a great job of outlining the advantages. Are there any disadvantages to going with open source uh, uh, platforms and software? Or is, or is it, it, the answer maybe no, but uh, 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 I thought I'd ask. So I, I think the, um, um, there was another uh, open source project relatively recently that um, got to a stage where it's recognized by the uh, industry um, uh, IoT groups, the industry 4.0 groups has been at a production ready stage. So, so typically with, with, all, uh, with all kind of early open source projects need to be a certain level of uh, maturity and stability. And that's what's been accelerated with the, um, the co-contributors uh, we have. So. Uh, Nexus is based on the, the whole business is based on security. IFM, the whole business is based on um, industrial instrumentation and connectivity. Uh, Adamos, the whole business is based around making machines. Um, uh, Intrum is a whole business is based on sort of solution engineering. We have a number of kind of PLC and uh, gateway manufacturers kind of built into this space. So we're essentially hyper accelerating uh, something to a good state, but also because we've selected just a uh, a sweet spot of capabilities that are required by the majority of use cases, the um, the likelihood for that to get to a production-ready state is extremely high in a short period of time. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. Uh, um, how can folks get involved in this open source project? Uh, 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 you know, you mentioned the meetup coming up. Uh, are there other are there other avenues available? Yeah, so um, so that there's a, a sort of growing dialogue on GitHub. So GitHub has uh, an issues page. So please kind of scan through there to see to see what issues have been raised. Also, kind of raise queries. Some of those kind of issues could be uh, requests to uh, support us in ways that aren't necessarily code. So uh, we have some contributors who are helping us with with demos. Some contributors are helping us with kind of user experience, kind of involvement and feedback. Um, 
So please use a GitHub as a first point of call. Uh, all console contact us on Twitter, but GitHub is the kind of first point of call we regularly monitor that. So, uh, but um, I suppose the maybe the um, uh, uh, outside of that, the first meetup will be the opportunity to sort of fully collaborate with a kind of a growing ecosystem of um, uh, stakeholders involved in this. Right. What are the next features on the roadmap, uh, on the development roadmap? Uh, uh, it sounds like there's a lot going on. Yeah, so so, um, so as I said, we're sort of focused on a uh, the, the, the specific capabilities required for cloud agnostic, secure IoT platform uh, connectivity and robust device management. So there are additional features uh, for that to allow improved well, uh, improved health, remote access, uh, and also support for uh, additional um, software artifacts uh, outside of Debian and Docker. So. I think so Snaps has mentioned on the architecture, and that's actually on the roadmap plan. Um, uh, we've we're, it natively supports um, so, uh, Azure um, IoT and also uh, Cumulosity IoT. We're working with one of our contributors to build the AWS uh, adapter in there. So so these these are all coming through. So um, and obviously what what you need to recognise is that it's a, it's an open source project. It's com community kind of built. So. We don't necessarily have the same definitive roadmap as you would do from a commercial project, and it's, but, but because of that, being driven by what the market needs. Right, and you mentioned just just now some of the some of the uh, some of the platforms that are involved. It sounds like everybody's involved. Are there is there anybody not involved that that's sort of a major player? I, I kind of can't think of one. Uh, so we are, well, so we're we're actively speaking to. Uh, most of most of the major players and all, all the you know, contributors and sort of speakers on the the session today. I mean, we'll welcome them to be welcome them into the fold as well. So, what once again, it's um, this is this is a uh, open source community driven activity. So we can only get to the result that the market's demanding if we actually contribute and work together. So, um, uh, yes, yeah. So we're 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 looking for uh, all contributions for all avenues to kind of speed up development. Right, right. Hey, you made one comment in your in your presentation that I thought was really interesting, and and I, I was wondering if I could get you to expand on it. And that is separating the business logic from the connectivity logic. Could you talk to us about that a little bit? I mean, why is that important? And, uh, how does it work? So, um, what what we found is um, in a in a in a number of projects. Specifically with industrial machine manufacturers, they they need to uh, maintain um, a high level of um, uh, separation between the different components they have. So kind of separation on hardware, separation on cloud platform, um, but also they, <clears throat> as the sort of connectivity component is heavily related to the cloud platform, then if they if they have uh, business logic that looks at kind of the perform performance metrics of a of an air compressor, as I mentioned. Uh, to date, there's been a lot of that. There's been a high need to actually have kind of almost different versions of that code or that firmware that would actually have multiple cloud vendors. So they need to need to manage that. And once again, by by separating the the business logic, so the the compute uh, angles that do the analytics, and perform create the KPIs, do the Kind of a high, uh, high, high frequency data analysis from those that manage the connectivity back to your platforms, then you can actually build the best of both and actually then be able to deploy them onto um, any hardware platform that would actually support that level of capability. So, um, and that, that's, I suppose it's um, almost kind of a, a software development one on one, isn't it? Actually, you, you modulize and sort of compartmentalize things. Um, and then that means you have so two bits of software you need to manage as opposed to one bit of software you need to manage for each combination of IoT platform and hardware. Right, I got a, uh, I got a question over the transom that I think perhaps refers back to some of the discussion we were having about, uh, about platforms, but uh, the, uh, the question is a bit cryptic, including graphical programming languages. Uh, uh, does, that, uh, does that ring any bells yeah. for you? Yeah, so, so the, the classic one here is um, Node-RED, isn't it? So I think a, a lot of, maybe not a lot of uh, production ready, but a lot of prototypes in the embedded space are developed using Node-RED. So it's free, it's open source, uh, and now it's kind of considered to be production ready. Um, so if, if you, 
with, with Node-RED, uh, a lot of times you'd have to create uh, multiple flows or segments of flows to connect to different platforms. Whereas what we're what we've what we've from found from our experience and obviously with our contributors' experience is that if you have um, well using Node Red and I think there's an example already on YouTube, all you need to do with a Node Red flow is actually send the data to a local MT the local MQTT broker before it's sent out. And then you can actually then set a configuration up to say, okay, yes, send it to Azure, yes, send it to Azure and Cumulosity IoT, so Azure, Cumulosity IoT and AWS or Deutsche, Deutsche Telekom uh, Cloud Dinga. So it simplifies simplifies that as well. Uh, and as always with uh, software uh, development. So <clears throat> what we what we're starting to have in the IoT space is a, a evolving need to manage software components in the same way that they've been managed efficiently in a structured way in the IT space. So you have specific tooling that looks at enterprise architecture evolution and management. And at some point in time, that will naturally come across to the IoT space because we have so many different software modules deployed into so many different assets, we need to manage in the same space. So if there's any way to reduce the number of software modules that we need to manage, that's generally better and more cost effective than having multiple versions out in the field. Right, right, terrific. Hey, you can always tell the questions that are coming from me, Philip, because they tend to be lower level. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've got another one, and that is, you know, we talk a lot about over-the-air provisioning, uh, and you mentioned OTA for updates of firmware and software, um, you know, and, and you mentioned it in, in the context of sort of managing licenses, et cetera. Uh, uh, can you talk to us a bit more about that? Do your less experienced users understand the importance of it? Um, so, so uh, yeah, so obviously, <clears throat> um, as I was speaking from a, uh, finished IO community point of view. So, um, uh, so the, I, I suppose that I think one of, one of the um, the panelists before mentioned there's a large difference between your, uh, let's say your uh, early early uh, IoT uh, company and your more mature IoT company who's actually got the the, the scratches and the bruises etc. from going through right. many different older <laughs> sets. Um, obviously, for the for the latter. The latter type, they have, um, they've got a, a number of devices out in the field, and maybe hundreds of thousands, and, and they know, and they, they they know that managing managing software is essential because there's there's issues need to resolve. The, the the example about the lift um, lift manufacturer, I mean, they're they're bound by local regulations to ensure the the, the level of connectivity, the support, the maintenance, the uh, local fire safety regulations, etc. Plus, also you have the the requirement to uh, update software, um, uh, uh, to to cope with I know security attacks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's a, there's a natural that's a natural need, but they've they've gone through all those hurdles to start with. I think for the um, let's say the the less the less mature um, organizations, I think they they they're a lot more savvy of of the need now than they were let's say a decade ago. Right. Partly because there's more, there's more uh, case studies of these larger companies. So, so if 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 a larger company talks about the bruises it suffered, then typically the smaller company starts to listen. Uh, but there there is this um, uh, what do you call it? A, kind of a pivot point, let's say, where it's kind of moving from a prototype to a POC or a pilot. And I think some one of the, the panelists mentions it as well. So you kind of go from a kind of DIY homegrown product. Then you try to work out, okay, how do we how do we scale it? And there's a there's a, a factor you need to move there. So typically, your let's say your POC has been based on business logic, and then your your pilot or first first deployment is actually then also based on operational logic, which device management is a key part of that. Right, right. No, terrific stuff, and and appreciate your perspective. <laughs> I'm sure there's a there's a lot of people there that could benefit from it. Uh, Philip Hooker. Uh, uh, Vice President of Strategic Programs and Cloud Innovation with Software AG. Hey, Phil, thanks so much. Really appreciate it, uh, enjoyed it, and uh, I'm sure our audience did as well.